It's time to hand out some postseason grades. We grade Kentucky's entire starting backcourt from this past season on today's episode of Locked on Kentucky. You are Locked on Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast specifically, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. That's Bet Online where the game starts. On today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be handing out some postseason grades. Going to be doing this for the next uh, few episodes. Going to be talking about Kentucky's backcourt specifically. Now that the season is over, let's hand out some grades for these individual players and just kind of assess how they did this season. Let's go ahead and get into it. How about we start with the phenom freshman, Ty Ty Washington. I'm going to give Ty Ty Washington his season a grade of B minus. Now you may say that may be a little too harsh. Let's go ahead and get into the numbers here. 12 and a half points per game, three and 3.9 assists per game, and then three and a half rebounds per contest for the freshman guard. The reason that I have Ty Ty Washington graded as a B minus is not because it, it wasn't necessarily because of anything that he could help. Obviously, Washington got injured during the Auburn game. He just never really was the same after that. A couple of episodes ago, we broke down the numbers for the backcourt, how essentially after the Auburn game and then after the Alabama game, every sim- single member of the backcourt statistically had some type of regression. Washington, before the Auburn game, before he got hurt, was shooting over 50% from the floor. Uh, and he ended the season shooting 45%. So he he took a bit of a statistical decline in several areas. And you can't necessarily blame him for that. I mean, he was playing, not he wasn't playing 100%. And I think that some people may get on to Coach Cal for continuing to play him. And look, if the kid was healthy enough to play, Coach Cal was going to play him. If he was not healthy enough to play, I do not believe John John Calipari was going to to put him out there. So I think you think it was just kind of a situation where you couldn't really couldn't really do anything. I mean, he wasn't playing 100%, and that obviously affected his ability to score, his ability to distribute, his ability to get rebounds, his ability to do anything. And, and you know, honestly, maybe B- minus is a little too harsh because, again, he could not control getting injured. Um, but, but you know, it, it, it is what it is. Uh, it is what it is. And I think that the regression at the end of the season, I mean, you have to, for me, I'm calling it like I saw it, it, it was a, a regression. It's a shame that it ended the way it did, but whatever. He had a career-high 28 points versus Tennessee. Then he had 17 assists versus Georgia early on in the season. He scored in double figures in 20 of the 31 games that he played. The first 17 games of his career, he scored in double figures 13 times, so 13 out of 17. And then the final 14 games of his career uh, here at Kentucky, and I assume he's gone, by the way. Let me just say that. I assume he's going to the NBA. His final 14 games... Uh, he uh, he scored in double figure seven times. So there's another there's another er- another area where you can point to a statistical regression for Ty Ty Washington. Again, just a shame that he went out the way that he did. Um, I mean, he he had some some decent games down the stretch, but it wasn't anything consistent. And that's going to be a theme on today's episode. It's just looking at the backcourt. It's just it, there was never anything consistent. At least I, I don't feel like uh, for and it's for a variety of reasons. Moving along here, how about Davion Mintz? Uh, I think that first of all, before we get into the numbers and we give him give him a grade, I just want to say I think Davion Mintz played his role pretty well. I mean, he, he was he was getting like what twenty four minutes a game somewhere around there, averaged eight point five points per game, one point eight assists per game, and two point two rebounds per game. I'm giving Davion Mintz a, a B grade for the season. Again, I think he filled his role well as a, as a backup guard. And you go and look at his game logs, and this is the reason why I don't have him as a B plus or an A minus. Is you go look at his game logs, he peaked statistically. He peaked early, like every other guard did. And then when Severe Wheeler and Ty Ty Washington were out due to injury, right there in the middle of the season, and he was having to carry the load, and he was getting these extra minutes, he wasn't necessarily doing anything 
impressive. I think that he was just kind of being who he was, and I don't think that he did anything that was... I don't want to say... Uh, I, he didn't do anything that was special. I'll say that. I, he, he didn't do anything crazy when they were out. Again, I think he played his role well, and I think that statistically, I mean, he was shooting, what, 30, 38% from the floor, 34% from three. He was a 70% shooter from the foul line. I think he's a good kid. I think he's talented. Uh, and and uh, again, just like Washington and just like these other two guys, I think statistically we saw a regression from this entire backcourt. And so it's really, really difficult to give these guys a grade that's higher than B plus. Honestly, it's just, and, and part of that you can blame on the coaching, but I think also part of it you can blame on the kids is that they, they just simply weren't making shots down the stretch and, uh, you, you've got to be able to do that. If you're going to make a run in the NCAA tournament, you've got to have good guard play. Uh, Kentucky did not get good guard play. As the season was winding down, they didn't get it against St. Peter's. So that's those are my two grades for Ty Ty Washington and Davion Mintz, a B- and a B. If you've got any thoughts on these two kids, let me know in the YouTube comments. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening on podcast format, you can hit the socials at Locked On UK. Give me your thoughts on what you thought these guys did this season and what grade would you have given them. I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Before we move on to the rest of the backcourt, I want to tell you guys about our friends at Run Your Pool. So essentially at this point in the year, we talked about it on yesterday's show a little bit. My bracket is just completely busted. I'm going to assume yours is as well, but don't worry. We believe in sec- second chances here, and so do our friends at Run Your Pool. Round up your friends who pick Baylor, Kentucky, or any other high seed to win it all and start a sweet 16 pool at runyourpool.com slash locked on. It's a chance to start a new, t- a chance to beat your friends now. Along with sweet 16 brackets, Run Your Pool offers square pools, yes, like the Super Bowl, uh, to keep things interesting every single week of the tournament. Brackets bust, but the fun does not have to stop. They have options to edit scoring, and they offer more intel to make your picks. It's all stuff you won't find at the big media bracket sites. Plus, they also offer full white glove customer support, custom branding, and one of the easiest three-minute setups that you will ever find. Clearly, we believe in Run Your Pool because we've run Survivor and Bracket Contest there this year ourselves. Start your second chance, Sweet 16 Pool, at runyourpool.com slash locked on. That's runyourpool.com slash locked on. Today's episode of Locked On Kentucky is also brought to you by Stat Hero. Guys, obviously, we just, we just talked about it. I absolutely love putting together brackets. I absolutely love March Madness, one of the best times of the year, hands down. Uh, but consistently, my bracket fails me. Uh, even the one uh, that, we, that we've been uh, doing over. If you're not on Run Your Pool, by the way, what are you doing? But the one over on Run Your Pool was not the most successful for me. It's been a while since I've actually won anything with a bracket. But this season, I've hedged my bets with Stat Hero's NCAA single game pick em contest. What Stat Hero does is they pit star players against each other in different matchups in an amazing hybrid between fantasy and sports gambling. It's very simple. It's very fun. You can start actually focusing on the players that you know best with a gameplay that doesn't exactly rely on big spreads or long odds or funky props. And in addition to their pick em games, they also have dozens of lineups that you can comb through to take on head to head. Stat Hero just simply posts sets of players for you to take on with a set of players that you choose yourself. Stat Hero is the easiest and fastest way to get your sports action fixed. The simple, sleek gameplay will have you playing within minutes. This is what Daily Fantasy was meant to be. You can sign up for free right now at stathero.com slash locked on and use promo code locked on for a 100% deposit match. Again, that's stathero.com slash locked on using promo code locked on. Terms and conditions apply. All right, moving along here on the Thursday edition of Locked On Kentucky. Lance Daw here with you. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. I want to remind everybody that we are free and available on all platforms. Postseason grades, the backcourt for the Kentucky Wildcats. Moving along here, Severe Wheeler. Next up on our list. Severe Wheeler actually has the highest grade out of all three, uh, all four of these guards, excuse me. I've got him graded at a B plus. Severe Wheeler averaged 10.1 points per game, 6.9 assists per game, and 2.6 rebounds per game. Severe Wheeler had some issues 
right? I think his shot selection was questionable at times. I think the way that he operated in transition was a little weird. I've even seen some of you guys, some of you listeners out there point out whenever he would run in transition and he didn't get a look, he would just wildly drive to the baseline and then just kind of stay there for a second and kind of be like, okay, don't know what to do. And then there would the, the offense, the half-court offense would just kind of slowly shut down after that. Um, and th- this is not to say the half-court offense is bad. I, I've probably... To, a break in the action here. I've probably talked a little too much on this show about transition offense, and I've probably talked about it too positively. Look, a lot of great things can come out of a half-court set. A lot of different teams out there play really, really well with a slower pace of tempo. Villanova, a great example, currently in the Sweet 16. They they play phenomenally. I believe they, they are in like the 240s in terms of adjusted tempo uh, on Kim Palm. They're a slower-paced team. Uh, they can make things work. But Severe Wheeler, to go back to talking about him for a second, he is primarily successful in transition. He really, really liked to push the pace for Kentucky. Obviously, the Wildcats wanted him to do so, and at times, he did a really good job of it, whether it was getting his own shot, getting to the rim, or creating for others. And early on in the season, the combination of Oscar Shibwe and Severe Wheeler was borderline unstoppable. I mean, these two guys were just incredible incredible when it came to their chemistry and whenever it came to running in transition you would get consistent rim runs from Shibwe and then Wheeler would also be there it was just phenomenal offense but again I think his frenetic pace sometimes didn't work out but overall I don't think he did a bad job I think he did a good job as Kentucky's point guard this season there are again a couple of things that if he does choose to return uh, there are a couple of things that he does need to continue to work out one of them being his shooting He's been working on that for three seasons now, and I expect to I would expect to see him continue to work on that. Because if he can develop a little bit of a three-point shot, then I think that he becomes a more dynamic player, and you would love to see that out of your point guard. You don't necessarily need scoring, like outside shooting from Severe Wheeler, but it would be nice to have. It would be nice to see. And then again, I think just perfecting his craft in transition. It's something else that he could potentially work on, but overall... I think he had a good season. I think he had a good season. 44.1% shooting from the floor, shot 30.8% from three, and then 78% from the free throw line. Had a uh, season-high 26 points versus North Carolina. And North Carolina in that game just simply could not keep up with the Wildcats in transition. He broke them down. Uh, Even at the half court, just getting to the rim whenever he wanted to. He's a very strong guard for his size, very physical. And then he also had double-digit assists in five different games. I believe he had 14 versus North Florida, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Very, very impressed with what I saw from Zavir Wheeler. Statistically took a dip, obviously, like all the other guards did, and then also took a dip uh, compared to his his, uh, second season at Georgia. But he also became, became a better shooter, I think, at Kentucky. And then overall, I think, became a more efficient player. Uh, with the Wildcats. So I gave Severe Wheeler a B plus. If you disagree with that, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. All right, final uh, final uh, backcourt player here, Kellen Grady. All right, this is this is probably going to sound extremely negative, but some of you some of you do agree with my stance on Kellen Grady. I've given Kellen Grady a grade of C uh, for his his uh, his season. This is his postseason grade a C because I feel like there were so many missed opportunities with this kid, and I, I'm, I'm disappointed with the way that the season ended for him. Averaged 11.4 points per game, 1.3 assists per game, 2.1 rebounds per game. It's not necessarily about the distribution or, or rebounding. It's about the scoring for, with, with Kellen Grady. He was shooting 44.6% from the floor, shot 41.7% from three to end of the season, and 74.4% from the foul line. Had a season-high 25 points against Alabama, and then proceeded... Uh, in the words of Max Kellerman, to fall off of a cliff uh, after that. I wanted to, I broke down numbers on the entire backcourt just a couple of episodes ago and how their statistical decline was one of the reasons why the Wildcats just kind of faltered at the end of the year. But I've got some more numbers here for you on Kellen Grady. So Kentucky played 34 games. When you look at the first third of the season, Grady was averaging 11.2 points shooting over 50% from the floor and 47% from three. Good numbers for the first third of the season. Then the second third of the season, he was averaging 12.9 points per game, 
44% from the floor is what he was shooting, and 43% from three is what he was shooting. So while his shooting numbers went down a little bit, his production increased. Coach Cal even talked about how he was begging Kellen Grady to take more shots, and he was getting confident. He was getting confident. And then in the third, third of the, uh, of the season, the final third of the season, he averaged 10.2 points, shot 40% from the floor, and 35% from three. So we went from 11 points to, tw- to almost 13, then back down to 10. And his, uh, his shooting numbers at the end of the season were, were poor uh, for, for, for anybody, especially your shooting guard. That, that's, those are not great numbers. His rise and the regression is what's going to stick out in my mind whenever I think about him in the coming years when we're, we're just looking back and it's just like, hey, remember that team that lost the round of 64? Remember, remember that team? Remember Shibwe and, and, uh, and Mintz and Wheeler and then Grady? And the moment we think of Grady, it's just think about what could have been if, if he had, had, uh, had a little bit more confidence in him. I feel like would been would have been one of the things that definitely changed his trajectory uh, towards the end of the season, and several of you've noted noted it. I've noted it. Whenever he got the ball and he had an opportunity to shoot uh, for the for essentially the back half of the year, he would sidestep everything. He wouldn't just shoot straight on. Whenever he caught something, he would take a dribble, sidestep. And then he he would act like he was shooting it sometimes, and give it up, and or sometimes he would he would shoot, and it would just be off because he had sidestepped and his balance was off. He, again, he just got got into his head, I think. Uh, and I I've not heard anybody else say this, but it kind of felt like later in the year, like knowing he wasn't a threat to get to the rim consistently, and knowing he wasn't a threat to shoot. He was just kind of there to pass the ball around, and he wasn't a great distributor. It almost felt at times in close games where the the offense was like four on five. It was like Kellen Grady was essentially a non-factor. And again, I don't want to ride on him too hard. I think he's a phenomenal kid. I think he's a good athlete. I think he is a good shooter. He just got in his head a little bit. At at least that's what I think. If uh, If you've got a different thought, let me know in the comments below. I've graded him as a C. I've graded Severe Wheeler as a B plus. All right, in just a second, I want to talk for a brief moment, and we'll probably continue to talk about this later on uh, in the offseason. Just kind of thinking about, I just kind of want to ask the question, who will be the leader for next year's team? Now that some of these players are gone, now that Shibwe is potentially gone, who's going to be the leader that steps up? And I don't necessarily mean from a number standpoint. I just mean who's going to be that leader? Before we talk about that, I want to tell you guys about our friends at Built Bar. Have you tried Built Bar Puffs? It's something new that Built Bar has come out with. Talked about it a number of times on this show. And let me just go ahead and tell you, I've tried them myself. They're absolutely phenomenal. It's a protein-infused marshmallow covered in chocolate. And there are so many different flavors. It's absolutely phenomenal. Built Bars are phenomenal. And the reason that Built Bars are so good is because they're actually healthy for you to eat. So you can actually replace your candy bars with these. And then you can look at the numbers. I mean, most built bars contain about 130 calories. You can compare that to a candy bar on average has 240. There's less sugar. There's more, there's more protein, significantly more protein. It's really good for you to eat. Tastes fantastic. They've got so many different flavors. They're coming out with new ones all the time as well. Again, they taste fantastic and they make it healthy. You can go to built.com Right now, and you can use promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your order. Again, you can use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, wrapping up the Thursday edition of Locked On Kentucky Lance Dahl here with you. The question I wanted to ask, who will be the leader of next year's basketball team? I don't think we can really determine uh, a, a legitimate answer right now because we've we've not gotten to see if Kentucky wants to pick anybody up from the transfer portal. We've not gotten to see if anybody wants to leave the Wildcats, and I certainly think that there are a couple of kids that might be considering that right now. But I wanted to run down the list of potential candidates, and I wanted to just kind of give my early thoughts on who could potentially be uh, the leader for this team. And again, doesn't necessarily mean statistically. I just mean I just mean. Who is going to be that vocal leader? Who's going to be that emotional leader? Who's going to be the one that steps up and is just kind of the face of the Wildcats? 
You've got a couple of options. One that immediately jumps out to me is if Severe Wheeler does opt to return, I think he is going to be one of the leaders on this squad. I, I definitely think that he would probably be, if we're if we're picking favorites right now, if we're picking leaders, he would probably be the front runner, runner to be the leader and be the focal point of next year's team, not necessarily from a schematic standpoint. I'm just saying, whenever you think about Kentucky basketball, you think about the guard, Severe Wheeler, for the most part. I think also uh, Jacob Toppin is a is another good option. C.J. Frederick, if he plays well, is another option. I'm really excited to see Damian Collins uh, get a, get a, a larger role with the team. I think he could be really fun to watch as well, and I think he could step up and be one of those faces of the program, be a leader. And then obviously you've got Chris Livingston and Casey Wallace coming in. Uh, to the program. So those two guys have opportunities uh, to step up and be leaders. So I, but, but if I, if I had to choose right now, it's either, it's either Wheeler or Toppin. And I just don't know if Toppin's going to have a significant enough of a role for people to acknowledge that he is uh, the leader. He'll certainly be one of them. Keon Brooks is also another one. Of course, some of you, some of you, oh man, uh, I've gotten to read some comments. Some of you, are not fond of Keon Brooks. And, you know, you can be frustrated with his play. I just don't think that it's as bad as some of you make it out to be. Uh, but Keon Brooks is another option. And then, obviously, you've got guys that will most likely be reserves, like Lance Ware, Dante Allen, Bryce Hopkins. I mean, we've essentially gone over every single guy that's going to be here next season, barring transfer the transfer portal, whether, whether it be kids coming or going. But again, Severe Wheeler, C.J. Frederick, Jacob Toppin, probably the three guys I'm looking at right now, and I'm curious to see what Chris Livingston's role and what Kaysen Wallace's role looks like with this team. If you've got any thoughts on who do you think the leader for this, this program is going to be next season, leave them in the YouTube comments. You can leave them on the socials as well. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. You can follow me on Twitter at LanceDaw underscore. You can follow the show on Instagram at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, leave them in the YouTube comments. You can also hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow. Have a good day, everybody, and God bless.